perfect example that there are no limits to the creative spirit. There are no limits to what a human being can do. We all need the tools and we all need the skills. And the Union Institute and University provides that. But it's up to the person to take these skills. And I said, as I said before, make them authentic. To really go out and roll your sleeves up, frequently when you don't have to, and go do the job that needs to be done. If I seem a little bit uh, prejudiced about this person, I certainly am. She's really been a great role model for me, a mentor in many respects, and we share ice cream. So certainly it hits all the important points. So it is with great, great privilege and great honor that I introduce to you Dr. Penny Sagan. And a lot of good stuff. There's some other stuff, too, that we may or may not get to. Um, it might be interesting to know how I came to you originally. That's kind of a... Uh, a terrific story. Um, as she mentioned, I'm heading an institute called the McKillar Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. And I grew up in abject poverty. When I say abject poverty, I had no running water, I had no indoor bath. I was in rural Maine, and um, my daddy did work sometimes and sometimes not. Uh, at eight years old, he told me that I don't have any money and I'll never have any money. And if you want any money, you've got to get a job. So he took me out to the local newspapers and I became the first newsboy uh, in Wyndham, Maine, which was a tiny little spot. Um, I was very lucky. Uh, I delivered newspapers. Uh, at the age 14 in Maine, you had a driver's license when you were 14 because we had to drive potatoes to the market. We were a huge potato growing state. And <coughs> my father said, any money that I made, I could spend any way I want to. So I saved over my paper route and so forth, I had saved uh, $75. And I took that $75 and I bought a car. Now, you have to only see what a $75 car is. <laughs> and, uh, but my big expense was reconditioned tires. And they were $6 each. And I would go through those tires because I was on the back, really the back roads in Maine. And I had the best job of my life at that point. I started a taxi service. And I used to drive the other kids to school because school was a long way away. And the school uh, trip, I charged them a quarter a week. And five years later, I sold my car for $125, so that was a good deal. <laughs> and anyway, <clears throat> because I was a poor kid, <clears throat> there was no possibility of my ever going to college. And as a matter of fact, my uh, high school, she was a nasty old advisor, used the following words to me. She said, you're not college material. So let's learn to type and do shorthand. So those words step, stay here. I'm not college material. Didn't exactly know what that meant. But, and so didn't go to college. At age 35, I met this wonderful woman in my building who was about 75. And she said to me, um, when did you go to college? And I said, well, I didn't. And she said, why? I said, I'm not college material. And she said, what in the hell does that mean? <laughs> and said, well, uh, 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 I'm not exactly sure what it means, but I guess I'm not smart enough. And she said, um, what do you mean? And I said, well, I never took algebra. That was my criteria for being smart. And she said, do you know what I do? And I said, no. She was a nice lady. I met in the elevator. And she said, well, I'm a mathematics professor. I have a PhD in mathematics. And she said, I've seen you up and down in this elevator for years. And she said, what do you bet that it would take me three weeks to teach you algebra? And I said, I'll bet you anything that you can teach me algebra. <laughs> well, she did. And the deal was that if she taught me how to do some algebraic formulation, that she would take me down to New York University and I would sit for something called a life experience test because I couldn't possibly sit for an SAT.
SAT because I hadn't had algebra, I hadn't had anything. So NYU had this wonderful program, and it was originally very much like Union. It was for women, basically women over 35. Their children had grown up, and these ladies were able to start college. And the test was marvelous. It was a test that they gave me six paragraphs to read. And they said, after these six paragraphs, we're going to give you a test on what you've read. Well, that didn't bother me too much because it was six terrific paragraphs about something or other. And then they gave me a test on the paragraphs. And the paragraphs, it was said, what happened to George? And why did Frank do this, et cetera, et cetera. And I passed with flying colors and started at my group. And at that time, I got myself a bracelet. And it was like a little ID bracelet. And the bracelet said, Dr. C in 83. So I knew that by 1983, I'd better get a PhD. That was my goal. And I went day and night, weekends, summers, and I finished my bachelor's at NYU. And, and I couldn't wait. I never did. But I wanted to tell that nasty old advisor that I was the <coughs> New York University Honor Scholar. I got the highest grades. I was also elected president of the senior class. I was the first woman to ever be president of the senior class. I then, I finished college in three years. Then I went to a master's program, which I finished in about eight months. And now I knew, I looked at that bracelet, I better get busy and see about getting a PhD. And I just felt that I couldn't sit there another moment longer because I've been sitting there for a number of years, and I thought, I've got to see a program, find some program that will enable me to do that, where I can do it my own pace, and I can study what I wanted to study. And what I wanted to become, I had a master's degree in social work, but what I wanted to become was a psychoanalyst. And lo and behold, Union gave me a doctorate in psychoanalysis. I took all my courses at a psychoanalytic institute. I took some at William Allison White. I took many at the New York Academy of Medicine. And I had the best, fantastic people at Union. You know what Union is. We, we are here with people from all different um, programs. And um, I got through my doctorate. I had eight people on my committee. And uh, it was a tough committee. However, I got through it. And uh, getting the doctorate at Union, talk about, talk about justice. Getting the doctorate at Union allowed me to do something that it would have taken me a long time to do. And it allowed me, as a PhD, to teach at NYU because they weren't giving any teaching assignments to anyone that wasn't a PhD. So very early on, I, got, uh, st I started teaching at NYU. And that was many years ago. I'm now in my mid-70s, so I've been there a very long time. And I credit Union with giving me this vital piece of education, which there's nothing like it. When I come here, it's like you talk about a homecoming. This is a homecoming. You folks that are in this program are just the luckiest people in the world. You're going to meet unusual people. You have no idea where this is going to take you, but it can take you anywhere you want. And, and I heard Arlene say, roll up your sleeves. Roll them up if you don't even have sleeves. Roll them up, because this is a great program. Now, what is urban justice? There's a, a, a wonderful center called the Urban Justice Center in New York, by the way. And the Urban Justice Center, I'll tell you who they work with. You'll find this terrific. They do homeless outreach. They do something called sex workers. They don't call them prostitutes. They call them sex workers. And the Urban Justice Center was formed by a guy who, he was, uh, his daddy, I think, was one of the founders in Germany of Bayer, which is one of the great pharmaceutical firms in the world. And this fellow decided he didn't want to go into the pharmaceutical business, and he had enough stock that he could do just about what he wanted to do, and he formed the Urban Justice Center. And what he does at the Urban Justice Center is get all kinds of volunteer social workers, PhDs, and many, many lawyers 
who give their time. And sex workers, he, they defend all the gals that are getting arrested. They defend street vendors. These are people, they defend the guys that wash the windows, the homeless. I mean, they do the most enormous job. There are probably maybe 400 lawyers now that are in there. That's urban justice. That's what these people do. They have a job during the day, and they give weekends, and they give nights, and they work for the benefit of, of people that couldn't possibly afford them. Now, about, mm, I, as you said, maybe five years ago, I wrote a program called, uh, it was called the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. And my original plan, which it's still pretty much what's happening, is um, to look at, to be a repository of knowledge, and to look at programs in the city, and we started in the city of New York, that I thought were failing. Now keep in mind, I'm a social worker, and my field was death and dying. I worked for years with um, folks with AIDS, and I was working with, with folks with AIDS in 1981, 82, when they didn't have a name for AIDS. They called it the gay node disease. And these guys, these poor souls, were dying within three months of data diagnosis. It was long before you saw anything that called the protease inhibitor. They weren't anywhere on the scene. And these fellows at that time, uh, the stigmatization, you cannot even begin to imagine. If any of you were around in that period, you know that everybody was afraid. They didn't know how do you get it. And... Uh, People lost their jobs. They lost their apartments. They couldn't get insurance. Families, their own families, often didn't even want them in the house. These young men and some women, they died. There was no nothing about not dying. They died. And they died in the worst possible way. They died of uh, pneumonias and, and cancers and uh, brain issues and, and, and fungus here and there. Um, the one thing they did all was die. And so I remember one particular, and this kind of motivated me in thinking of justice. I went to visit a fellow in the hospital, and he had about, and I, I being working with him, I figured he had about three weeks to live. And he actually had about four weeks to live. And he was covered with carposy sarcoma. He had spots. He had pneumocystic pneumonia. He was in terrible shape. He'd lost 40 pounds. And I went in to visit him, and I sat on his bed. And in the back of the room, I kind of looked in the back of the room. There was someone in the back of the room that looked like a spaceman. It was someone dressed in a whole, um, you know, looked like someone that would work with the Ebola virus. Um, and so I sat on his bed, and when I left, I hugged him. I wasn't wearing gloves. And part of that is not that I was stupid. My husband was in the business. My husband ran the laboratory. And we knew we knew in the laboratories that you don't get it by hugging somebody or sitting on their bed. That's not how you get it. So I had no problem. I hugged him, and I walked out the door. And as I'm leaving, I hear this shuffling. And I look around, and it's the space person <clears throat> shuffling along with, with the hospital sneakers and, and booties over the hospital sneakers. And she said, not coming too close to me, she said, I want to thank you very much for being so nice to my son. She said, you know, I can't go near him because I have grandchildren. And it was just so tragic. And, you know, I said, you know, you don't get paid that way. There was no, there was no listing. And when he died, uh, she said to me, she called me and said, I would like you not to attempt the funeral. And so I thought to myself, well, I will honor that, but I am going to attend the funeral. I'll stand up back. I won't bother her. I won't do a thing, but I'm going to attend. And she gave a speech that I'll remember every word to this day. And it said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to my son's funeral. And uh, in lieu of uh, gifts and flowers, I want you all to make a contribution to these, this horrible disease. My son, you know, died of multiple sclerosis. 
And then she saw me going out and she looked at me and she said, well, you know I have a summer camp for children and I can't let anyone get a group of eight. That's typical. That's a typical story of the things that were happening. And so where is the justice? You know, where is the justice? Um, it became very important to me to uh, work. As a matter of fact, one thing I'm very proud of is I won the Diego Lopez Award. That's the award given the social worker they feel has done the most in the country for AIDS. And I, I really did. I did a lot. I did a lot. It was uh, my passion. Um, and it still is, when I tell you what McSilver is doing now, it still is on, on a level. The McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research, we're a repository of information. We're like a big, huge file cabinet that we gather all kinds of research material, and we have it in our file cabinet. For instance, uh, one of the first projects we took on was foster care. Now, those of you, how many of you live in Florida? Okay, then you folks that live in Florida know that Florida is really the pits in terms of foster care. They lose so many children. The children have a horrifying time. They're raped and they're, they're and then they're 18 years old, they're phased out, and they get like, you know, 100 bucks, and they say goodbye. And, and what happens to them? It's a, it's a very bad, now New York City was not much better. Um, so what we wanted to do is go into the foster care system. Right now I have 50 researchers working. And these are all PhD students. And what we do is we go into the foster care system with the approval uh, of the New York City Mayor Bloomberg, who did something that no mayor has ever done before and probably won't be done, af won't be done after. He turned over his data to us on foster care. Well, we're mining this incredible amount of data. And our job is to look at it and find the flaws, find out what's wrong, find out what's needed, present it to the city, and hopefully be involved in some of the remedial work. Now, uh, the NYU School of Social Work, it's the NYU Silver School, we have, and this is shocking to imagine, we give the city of New York 600,000 hours a year on the street. We do, every student does at least three days a week internship, and we have an awful lot of students. And if you can imagine, the city of New York, without 600,000 hours given by the social worker, I don't know how the city would do it. I mean, I really don't. And there are three other schools of social work that also have hours. And that's pretty much how it started. Now, to go back to AIDS for a moment, um, I'm, all, I'm on the board of New York University. I'm a trustee. I'm also on the board of the University Hospital. And I was sitting at one of the hospital board meetings, and a uh, young fellow got up, and he was so excited because he had just gotten a grant from the NIH, the National Institute of Health, and he was so happy because he got a $4 million grant. I'm telling you, I had to sit there with my hand over my mouth because the day before, Nick Silver got a $5 million grant to work on AIDS. And what we're doing with this grant, I have probably 30 researchers on this one, and we're researching children diagnosed with AIDS but untreated. And there are so many. And there are so many. And the medications are free. I mean, the, the pharmaceutical firms will give you the medication, and they still, and if you go to Africa, I mean, West Africa, it's horrific. I don't know. The, the problem in Africa, I remember going to a village, to a village in Africa, and a school. And the children wanted to sing a song. And the teacher said they want to sing a song. And these were little, little children. They were probably six, seven, eight. And they had little blue outfits on, ties. They were the cutest kids you ever laid your eyes on. And they came out. And none of them speak English, but they wanted to sing a song for me. So I thought they would sing some wonderful African song. And they, they stood up like this and they said, Half the magic dragon. <laughs> and if you know the words to Half the Magic Dragon, I mean I howled. I howled my head off. I howled all the way and I was on a little tiny airplane. And as we left, the little children, they were all and we were on it was a dirt runway. We were on this little tiny airplane. And the children were waving. And I am telling you, 
three quarters of a penny, they were never going to live. I never howled so hard in my life. Hmm. I felt guilty leaving. I felt that's where I should be. So what is urban justice? It's doing what you know you need to do. It's doing what you can do. It's rolling up the sleeves that you don't have. And um, this is the place you're learning wonderful things here. When you're with wonderful people, you have Dr. Sachs, and you have the most adorable, terrific president in the whole world. <laughs> well, I'm going to have lunch with tomorrow. <laughs> and you have all these terrific folks. You're fortunate. You newbies. Um, you couldn't have made a better decision for yourselves. You could not. And uh, I wish you the best. And uh, again, you've got the best. So you're going to do wonderfully well. As I say, I'm so impressed you made this choice. It's a great choice. Nice to see you.